the riskier the sex, the better the high. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like a totally different high for me when it was uh, without a condom. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes with Todd and Tootsie. Today we are joined by Rob Graves, author of the new memoir, I, Rob Graves, My Struggle with Childhood Trauma, Homosexuality, and Bipolar Disorder. Today, Rob will attempt to break the stereotype of people with bipolar disorder, as well as those who are labeled mentally ill. But before we do that, I'd just like to ask our viewers to hit the like button and subscribe to our new channel, as it will help the YouTube algorithm and help our new channel to grow. Welcome, Rob. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. (laughs) Absolutely. What do you think the stereotypes are about somebody who has bipolar disorder? Oh, there's so many, basically, that were just off the wall crazy, that we do nothing but spend money, that uh, we're rageaholics, and that uh, for a few stereo, for a few of us, that we're you know sex fiends. Those are the three that come to mind. Okay. Would you say you fit any of those before you were treated? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. I was mm-hmm. a rageaholic, and uh, I was definitely a sex fiend. Okay, so let, yeah, let's talk about that, because I, in your memoir, you obviously detail a lot of stories about both, so it mm-hmm. seemed like your bipolar did manifest with a lot of sex addiction and uh, fits of rage. Um, let's start with the sex part. Okay. Um, yeah, why not? Just, yeah. just jump right just into jump it. Just jump right in. <laughs> yeah. um, so you knew you were gay from a young age. Yeah. Um, and one of the stories you told was how your mom actually took you to church. Right. Uh, essentially to cure you right. of homosexuality. Right. Um, do you feel like that maybe played a role in your wanting to have anonymous sex and keep sex kind of hidden? That, you know what, I never thought of it like that. I honestly didn't. Uh, but no, no. Um, my uh, my anonymity of having sex started innocently enough just at Highland Park. One day I was reading by the reservoir and randomly a guy came up and propositioned me and I had no idea what was going on. Uh, I had no idea that that's what went on after dark at Highland Park. Uh, and I was intrigued by it. Uh, so I went back. And uh, that's, in there lays the uh, the beginning of my sex addiction and the beginning of my anonymous sex addiction because I was so enthralled by it the first time that uh, I had to have it again and again. It's like uh, that first time you take heroin. You have to have it again and again. Mm-hmm. So, was this was prior to you receiving any form of treatment for your bipolar disorder? Right. Okay. Right. I did not get treatment for my bipolar disorder until I was forty-four, and I'm forty-eight now. Okay. And so, how about how old were you when Highland Park uh, situation? I was uh, just about twenty-one. I was okay. Just turning twenty-one. Okay. Interesting, and. Um, so do you recognize that at that point in time that you were having these mood shifts where you would be hypomanic, for example? Would those be some of the times that you would go to Harlem Park, for example, when you were really young? Mm. Or um, was it you know, maybe kind of separate? Was it more just kind of your sexuality being expressed? Well, in the beginning, I was just trying to figure out my sexuality. And then uh, the thrill of it, really kind of kept me coming back for more. Uh, And I was self-medicating. So I was self-medicating my mania through anonymous sex. Mm -hmm. So I would get very, very high or very, very manic, I should say. Uh, And I would go to the park or go to, you know, an adult bookstore, an adult theater, and um, just meet whomever was available. And that kind of kept me level set. 
I had always been treated for depression. Mm -hmm. um, I was being treated for clinical depression since I was 16. So I knew, I knew the game. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I but just, so, some, somewhere along the line, they missed the the hypomania component. Yeah, because I didn't tell them about it. I I, oh, I, I wasn't okay. honest. Okay, I talk about in the book a lot about in the book um, being honest with your therapist, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that they missed the mark. I wasn't honest. Sure, and that's the key. As soon as I was honest with my therapist at the age of 44, it was like a light went off in both of our heads. Sure. And she's like, you're not clinically depressed. You, you're suffering from bipolar depression, mm -hmm. which is one of the you know, more severe types of bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to be clear for our viewers, um, all that time, you know, two decades worth of uh, sex addiction, uh, you know, multiple partners, repeated anonymous sex. You never told your therapist about that? Never. Wow. The, because of the shame involved? The shame. Mm -hmm. I thought it was all part of being gay. Mm -hmm. I thought it was normal. Mm -hmm. and well, I, that, that's kind of one of the stereotypes of gay men mm -hmm. is that it's, that, you know, that's part of the culture, correct? And right. so where, where, where am I missing as a straight guy? That the you know the kind of the culture versus something where you took it for example. Well, the culture, and it's not. I don't want to. I don't even want to call it the culture because it's it's a very or maybe subculture. It is a subculture. Mm -hmm. That's exactly okay. the right phrase. It's mm -hmm. a subculture, and there are millions of of, of gay men that just don't partake in that subculture sure. but there's a handful that do mm -hmm. and i took it to the degree of doing it every day okay doing it multiple times every day where it was controlling my life mm -hmm. hence the addiction hence the addiction mm -hmm. so multiple times at your peak it was multiple times every day so mm -hmm. i would my routine would go to work go to the bookstore the adult bookstore for for those listening when i say bookstore i mean the the cd <laughs> little bookstore on niagara street or uh, uh you know um where you 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 go to get off mm -hmm. and um i would hit the crowd cuz i knew the the times i would go home shower have dinner go back for the late night wow there so, were times where I, I'd have five partners in the five o'clock hour and five partners in the 10 o'clock hour. Okay. It just was that controlling. Mm -hmm. And this was also, we're talking about mid to late 90s when you started this. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. obviously HIV AIDS was oh, very it prevalent. Was rampant. And so, and you never contracted it somehow. No. By the grace of God. You know, I was never a spiritual person, uh, but I believe that someone was watching over me because the riskier the sex, the better the high. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a totally different high for me when it was uh, without a condom. So because you knew you were actually risking potentially contracting AIDS, right. it actually got you off more. and It got, got you, me off it, more, yeah. Hmm. So, so when you were at your, at your height, when you would engage in this, these behaviors, was that something that you said you kind of got high from it, but did it also kind of level you out, like to get to the point where then you could go to sleep or, mm -hmm. you know, so it must have kind of taken the edge off, so to speak, yeah, right? Yeah, I was never, I was never one to hyper clean my house. Uh, I was never one to stay up all hours of the night mm -hmm. because I was self-medicating and, 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 and going through that process and, and using sex as a medication, I was leading a completely normal life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was well-employed. I had an apartment. I had a car. I had a great social circle. Um, no one knew anything. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like you were living a double life? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
because yeah. your friends, your family, your nobody knew this about no you. No one knew. Mm-hmm. No I, one knew. I didn't know. I should have known when we met when you were naked serving jello shots at a pool party, <laughs> but I actually I actually had no idea. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I thought that was just for fun, but I guess you were. That was a little <laughs> precursor to my life. Yeah. 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 So, it, so that was one of the ways that you dealt with, with, with the mania. And, but it must have interfered. Did you uh, attempt to have any type of romantic relationships during the, that time period? I did. And crash and burn. Mm-hmm. Crashed and burned. Uh, never more than six months. Usually six weeks was my 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 time frame of uh, get in, get out, get over, and mm-hmm. get over it. Mm-hmm. Were you able to stay faithful in those? Even oh in those no, no, right. no, no. Yeah. Yeah, at that point, it was probably too entrenched in your no. coping. The skills addiction room. was just too intense. Mm-hmm. Were there were there other things besides sex that you used to self medicate? Uh, other, no. Okay. That was no, just, that I was your never go-to. used drugs. Okay. Uh, I alcohol was didn't really do me. It did me dirty. You know when I when I got drunk, I would go into rages. Okay. And I talk about some of those in the book where, you know, um, should I tell them the, yeah. the New York story? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we were day drinking in New York City. Me uh, and two of my friends, and uh, we were just pounding prickly pear margaritas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was, you know, talk about stereotypes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say Miller Lite for a second, then no, I was like, no. <laughs> no. Um, no, and um, we just ended up in on 14th Street and in around Stonewall. And we were like, oh, we've got to go to Stonewall and pay homage to our, our uh, those who fought the fight before us. And so we went in, and I'm like, let's just get some waters. I, I was trashed. And uh, for three waters came to $30, mm-hmm. and it just set me off. I don't know why. But it set me off. It was a trigger. Mm-hmm. And went up to the bartender, wanted an immediate refund, and I was leaving the bar because I was so offended to pay $30 for three bottles of water. And uh, he said something smart, and I said something back to him, and we ended up arguing. And I ended up th- opening the bottle of water and throwing it at the bartender at Stonewall in okay. New York City. Wow. Ran out of the bar because he started chasing me. And he ended up tackling me outside in front of Stonewall. And we ended up in a fist fight. Wow. And uh, crowds broke us up. I saw the cops coming. So I hightailed it out of there because I was in no condition to talk to the police. Uh I ended up on the PATH train and took it to 34th Street. Had no idea what I was going to do, what my plan was. My friends abandoned me. They were so mad. Mm-hmm. They were, they're like, what did, what are you doing? And, um, I called them and my one friend was like, what in God's name is your problem? I'm like, I have no idea what just happened. Mm-hmm. And it was just, they didn't want to talk to me. I came back. They, they, to, to where I met them where they were on Christopher Street and they weren't having it. So I ended up going back to Jersey City where we were staying, found a cheap hotel, sobered up. And by then my uh, cell phone had died because, you know, we didn't have pocket chargers or, you know, bars that let you charge your phone during, mm-hmm. you know, a drunken rage because, you know, <laughs> asked the bartender at Stonewall if I could yeah. charge my phone. Probably wasn't a good idea. Right. Um, um, but I had to, I had to come to terms with that because I almost lost a friendship. Yeah, and sure. um, I had to forgive myself, and I had to ask for forgiveness, 
And and that's not an easy thing to do. Asking for forgiveness for something completely ridiculous isn't always easy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was uh, it, was that a wake up call for you, Rob? As far as saying I need to get help at this at that point, or did you just? I've kind of never stuff been it down? that drunk again. Oh, okay, so I've never allowed myself to get that drunk again. Okay, uh, because there's been other instances of drunken rages. And I have lost friends. I lost a very dear friend of mine uh, to a drunken rage. And he's still, there's a whole chapter in the book. Um, Jim, I lost my dear friend Jim uh, to a drunken rage. And to this day, he will not forgive me uh, for what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that that was a very, for anyone who knows you, it's it's shocking because you're such a sweet guy and just like your other friends who were like, what, what is going on with you? It's, right. it's hard to picture. Right. But when you hit someone with keys in the face, I did. it's shocking. And you were actually involved in an arrest for assault. Right, right. I got a so, uh, fake press charge. I hit someone with my keys in mm-hmm. that inci- incident, and uh, he pressed charges against me. Mm-hmm. And luckily, he was so drunk, he pressed charges against Jim, and the whole thing got thrown out of court. Right. Mm-hmm. But I could have, I could have faced real uh, uh, penalty for that because there was probably fifty witnesses outside of the bar who yeah. saw me do it. And so, was there any point that you thought there was something going on with you that you know was causing you to be this out of control, or you still didn't understand at all? Didn't understand it. Yeah. Didn't understand. Didn't put Mm -hmm. two and two together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, because I was so successful. I had a great job. I had a great Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. I was just about to buy my first house. I, you know, I had it all. You know, my parents had accepted me after, you know, the church incident. My mom came to terms with it. My dad came to terms with it. My family, my brother and sister, um pretty much said, we don't care, we love you anyways, when I told them. Um, So I had a great life. And um, there was just a dark side to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was the tipping point? What what was there, was there an incident or a situation or just a a time period where you said, okay, you know, now I need to kind of come clean. I gotta um, talk to my therapist about what's actually going on in my life. Well, I had, I always had a hard time finding a therapist after George. My therapist, when I was in uh, high school and college, and then into my early twenties, died mm. suddenly, and it was the most traumatic uh, death that I've ever experienced. And I dedicate the book to him. Um, because he meant that much to me, and he's the one who taught me forgiveness and acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm leading my life on now, is um, knowing how to forgive, knowing how to accept myself for who I am. Uh, But what triggered me uh, to get back into therapy was I wanted to go on Truvada, the antiviral medication Mm -hmm. uh, known as PrEP. Mm-hmm. And my doctor, my primary care doctor, would not prescribe it because he didn't know enough about it. Okay. And I thought that was horrible. Uh, and I immediately left his practice and went to an LGBTQ-friendly uh, practice that was born out of the AIDS crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, AIDS Community Services uh, uh, became Evergreen Health Services in Buffalo. And I went to Evergreen, and their intake, man, was it a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wanted to know how many partners you had. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't honestly answer because... You lost track. I lost track (laughs) after a couple hundred. Mm -hmm. I honestly have no clue how many sexual partners I've had. And that was a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. And... In order to go on it, I had to answer those questions, and they're like, "Well, at least you're you're getting on the right drug." Uh huh. Um, Did you have to just ballpark it or something? <laughs> I lied. I'll oh, be honest. Okay. I said, "You know, last thirty days, I've probably had ten partners." Mm-hmm. 
which okay. it was a down it was a slow period for me <laughs> <laughs> so it was accurate uh-huh. um but it was a real wake-up call just having to be that brutally honest with your physician um made me take pause and i found uh, an lgbt friendly therapist um one that i really connected with mm-hmm. and when i found jenny um we connected just like george and i had connected all those years ago mm-hmm. and was i was able to finally be honest with her talk to her about the rage talk to her about the the anonymous sex and she put two and two together relatively quickly mm-hmm. and uh, went on uh, a prescription uh, that really turned the light off to my addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went through withdrawal. I fell off the wagon a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so you went through a, a physical withdrawal from the, from the sex? Or I was went it through more an emotional? emotional withdrawal. Okay. A... What do I do with my time now? Mm-hmm. I was spending five, six hours a day in search of sex. And now I have nothing to do. Mm-hmm. So I started gardening. Uh-huh. I planted some pansies. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's much healthier activity yes. for sure. Yes. <laughs> um, well, that, but that makes sense, you know, because it's like you said, your your kind of free time revolved around that pursuit, right. and not, then when you were, I'm assuming it was some kind of mood stabilizer, mm-hmm. right? And then it took the edge off as far as needing to go down that yeah. route, and you probably had opened up with your therapist about uh, the behaviors, and that's something that you probably got to a point where you said, "I can't do this anymore," right? right? You know what really was the nail in the coffin of my addiction Hmm. was writing the book. Mm. I went away for 10 weeks by myself in Clearwater Beach, Florida on a houseboat to write the book. I knew I wanted to write it and I'm like, I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna take the time off work and it was so cathartic to write that book, to to write this was it ended my addiction i haven't had sex anonymously since coming home from clearwater wow what do you think it was about writing the book like did did you feel this need to tell everyone your story yeah you know what talk about sharing my dirty laundry (laughs) (laughs) yeah um if people come away with this with one thing It's to be honest with your therapist. You're paying them a lot of money, Mm -hmm. and if you're not if you're not being honest with them, you stay home. Right. Mm -hmm. Stay home. Don't bother. You got to be honest with your therapists. Yeah. Do you feel like those were? I mean, I know your therapist was obviously important to you in your Mm -hmm. life. You dedicate your book to him, but do you also feel like you lost a lot of years to? I lost a lot of like interviewing new therapists and trying to find a replacement for George and you know and then I just stopped going and started getting my antidepressants through my primary care Mm -hmm. but did you feel like your therapy wasn't as productive and it wasn't yeah it was Mm -hmm. just treading water yeah Mm -hmm. because I wasn't being honest yeah Mm -hmm. what made you decide to be honest the, the second time around especially after you had you know, been in that lifestyle for such a long period of time. I think I just want to be loved naturally and not anonymously. Mm. Don't, isn't that what we all want just to be loved? Sure. So, yeah, Yeah. and I'm never, I would never be able to get that being who I was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that. Yeah, yeah. I've, when it comes to anonymous sex, the concept to me really is almost kind of like using another person for masturbation. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because it's, you have no 
there's no real connection there. There's no intimacy there. It's just using another person mm-hmm. to get you off mm-hmm. and they're using you to get you off. Right. And it's one of those things where typically it's, you know, it's just one of those things that people don't, um, unless it is a form of addiction and, and self-medication, uh, yeah, f- tend to get a lot out of that after a while. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it sounds like, you know, since you've gotten on medication and opened up and wrote your book and so on and so forth, you realize that that's probably kind of what you were, what you were experiencing and now you want more, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I want, I want a life that just, I want a life that my mom wanted for me. You know, mm-hmm. when I came out to her, she's like, your life is going to be so hard being gay I'm like well it doesn't have to be mom I, that's what I said to her back then but I really did have a hard life you know and her fear was my reality up until four years ago how much different do you think it would have been if you were straight and bipolar mm. because I definitely think the anonymous you know, the, the high volume sex wouldn't have been an, as much of an outlet the way it is in, in the gay community. Well, it's harder to get. Yeah. Well, you would have to so, fork over a lot of money, probably. Yeah. A lot of prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of prostitution. Yeah. yeah. I mean, especially even before, you know, we're talking about the days before online dating or, right. you know, even uh, f- finding escorts online. You, you know, you'd have to be going down, you know, Lyle Avenue. Right. For, for right. example, if you were if you were straight at that point, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm wondering if was there any um, when you had this anonymous sex, was there any type of um, violence or assault or you know that kind of came along with it that you experienced? Um, there was a couple of issues. I was never physically assaulted. Uh, there was a couple of issues where I was robbed coming out of a bookstore. Okay. Um, where he put a, he just, he wanted my money. He mm-hmm. uh, put a knife to my throat, pushed me in my car. I gave him my money and he got out. Um, was this one of the guys you were hooking up with? Or no, just somebody... no, just some random oh, drug okay. addict who was looking for cash okay. uh, outside of. Because it was, the, I'm assuming that bookstore was like in the seedier part yeah, of town? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Right by Liberty Pole. Okay. And I know that's, your the title of your book, obviously your name is Rob Graves, but it comes from the idea that you, you know, you dodged death so many times. Yeah, it's your- not mm-hmm. just, um, um, I played Russian roulette mm-hmm. for, for 20 plus years. Mm-hmm. And I literally robbed graves. It's it's a it's a coy play on my name, mm-hmm. but it is the story of my life. Right, mm-hmm. because not only sexually were you putting yourself at risk, but physically. Right. Um, and there was a, there was an incident where you your apartment was robbed right. by someone you had sex with. Right. And so, you know, again, did you ever stop and think like how often you are risking your life for this? Or again, that just made it even better for you um i was so caught up in my addiction that i didn't look at the harm that could have befallen me as a problem Mm -hmm. yeah financially it screwed me up for a couple of months when you know he robbed my rent money um and, um, you know, it just was not something I gave a second thought to mm-hmm. because I just. You almost want- saw it as a side effect, maybe, yeah. of, of the yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. Wow. Is there a history of addiction in your family? Oh, yeah. Parents mm-hmm. are alcoholics, grandparents are alcoholics. Mm-hmm. And did you ever associate your sex addiction with that? Never considered it an addiction until. Probably, oh, probably, I knew I had a problem probably six years ago. I I realized that 
that I was dealing, I put a label on it, mm-hmm. so to speak, mm-hmm. um, and didn't do anything with that label for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, it definitely uh, needed, uh, it's definitely a uh, family trait. Uh, so is bipolar. My mom suffers with mental health issues. Uh, my grandmother was in and out of institutions growing up and as an adult. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, bipolar is is hereditary. Mm-hmm. Uh, or at least I believe it. it's a hereditary that kind of is dormant for a while. Like mine didn't... Um, Mine didn't manifest itself truly until my 20s. But I talk about rage events as young as five. You know, the Christmas, the great Christmas tree event. Mm-hmm. When I was five years old, my brother and sister were putting up the Christmas tree wrong. And I went batshit crazy. I mean, I literally threw a temper tantrum for the better part of four hours. And Why? Because my Christmas tree looked like Charlie Brown's. Mm -hmm. And that was the only reason. Yeah. So it sounds like you had, you know, obviously some kind of genetic predisposition to being highly sensitive or um, when it comes to rage, maybe a baseline of irritability. Right. Right. And then it was something that you would just get triggered by. Right. Like the Christmas tree or right. the thirty dollar bottle, three bottles of water, or whatever it would right. be, and then it was something where it kind of took over, mm-hmm. and so which is it's so difficult to tease these out, right? As far as like, is that just depression talking? Is that you know, is that something that's related to bipolar disorder? Is that something that's just kind of on its own? But it sounds like um, that's also something that you haven't in the last four years, anyways, ex- experienced as well. Like any um, rage? No, no rage in the last mm-hmm. four years. Okay. Since I've been medicated. Mm-hmm. Better living through pharmacology. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a believer in it. And, and I talk about it in the book. You know, you know you're know, you a diabetic, you take your insulin. Sure. You're bipolar, you, you, you know, you take your mood stabilizer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, of course. Did you ever feel any, how did you feel when you were diagnosed? Was it relief? Was there any shame? Was there any... Uh, confusion was it a light bulb what was the moment there was definitely a light bulb it kind of put all of the it connected all the puzzle pieces my life was finally connected Mm -hmm. and i understood it um but it took me a while to work through the addiction and stop stop the behavior Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you can treat it but you can't. You got to modify your behavior, and that took me some time. Sure. Well, like you said, you went through withdrawal. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing that you know, it's tough to understand sometimes. But you'll have this, you know, primary diagnosis, so you have bipolar disorder, and then it's one of those things where you self-medicate through sex. Then that ends up becoming a problem entirely on its own, mm-hmm. separate from that. So then you have the addiction piece. So then you have to kind of decide, how do I treat this? And the reality is that you have to kind of treat both simultaneously, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, and, um, but it's a lot to handle. But I give you a lot of credit for really leaning in and saying, I'm going to take this on. Um, Because if you would have continued to um, leave that part out, you probably would still be suffering from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am... um I'm a walking billboard for pharmacology adherence <laughs> and uh, treatment compliance, mm-hmm. you know, and honesty. And um, you've got and, – and, and what comes with that is you've got to forgive yourself. Sure. And you've got to accept yourself, you know, and that took me a while to do. I don't think I – really came to terms with forgiveness and acceptance even though I learned about it through George when I was 16 Mm -hmm. I didn't put it into practice until I was writing the book Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sitting 
you know, watching the dolphins go by in the fetal position sobbing because I had a regression and memories just came flooding back and got my, pulled up my bootstraps and went right back to the computer and started writing again. Mm-hmm. Because someone's going to read this. Someone's going to read this and someone's going to say, hey, if that jackass can do it, so can I. Mm-hmm. Can you can you talk a little bit about the process when you're writing the book about what what emotionally you were going through? Again, was you said you used the word cathartic, cathartic, right? And so it was something that were you kind of looking outside of yourself and saying like I'm writing about almost like this entire other person. Yeah, it was kind of um, it was kind of like I was in a third person. You know, I, mm-hmm. my for for ten weeks I was. Um, you're the biographer. I uh, yeah, <laughs> and looking mm-hmm. into myself, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was uh, just uh, constantly. I was either writing, sleeping, laughing, crying, or eating because you know I like to eat. <laughs> well, we need it. <laughs> but you weren't having sex on the boat. But I was not having <laughs> sex on the boat. Uh-huh. Uh. Which is kind of shocking and, you know, was probably a new thing. I mean, the old Rob would have been like, hey, I got a boat. I yeah. Mean, bring, well, it was kind of hard back. because, yeah. uh, you know, I was moored off the coast. So the only way to get anyone there was to pick them up at my dinghy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I, not a fly that, ride. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm sure you would have found a way if you had to. You you were very creative yeah. in, in how you procured sex in the yeah. past. So. Yeah, yeah. So in the gay community, I mean, obviously you had so many different partners. And um, when you look at it now, do you see it as a lot of people with some type of untreated addiction or illness that's kind of manifesting out there in this world? Or how much of it is just the fact that guys are horny and you get two guys together and they're going to have sex? Like what's yeah, the... Yeah, high testosterone levels. Yeah. You know what? Um, there... There was a handful of regulars that you'd get to know, but really, it was the guys on business trips, the guys coming in from across the border from Fort Erie because they didn't want to be associated in Fort Erie, or a lot of married guys. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. A lot of married guys trying it for the first time. I can't tell you the number of cherries I popped. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Was that a question on the primary care intake? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, especially from our generation uh, up, it's one of those things where we grew up with, you know, all the stigma surrounding being gay and so mm-hmm. on and so forth, where, you know, like Gen Zers are in high school right. um, and very proud of it and so on and so forth, right. which uh, there's been a lot of progress made, but it's something that I think there's a whole generation of men out there that got married and had children, had families right. that probably weren't heterosexual or maybe they were bi or pan or whatever. And, right. you know, it's one of those things where um, then they ended up uh, finding um, spots like you did mm-hmm. and, you know, and kind of leading, really leading double lives as well. Right. Right. There was um, a lot of, um, don't ask me my name. I'm uh-huh. not giving you my name. So truly anonymous. <laughs> truly anonymous. <laughs> uh-huh. Truly anonymous. Uh, and, and I don't judge. I don't judge because sure. coming out is very hard. Um, being married and having those feelings, I can't imagine how hard that is would be when you have someone you're responsible for or children that you're responsible for. Um, it's a very, very personal decision to come out. Um, and that's, it shouldn't be a decision to come out. Right. Right. We shouldn't have to, uh, you don't, you didn't have to announce that you were straight. Yeah, of course. You know, we sh- there's, We've got to get beyond the labels. Mm-hmm. And I talk about that at the end of the book. 
We've got to get beyond the mental health labels, the stereotypes. We've got to get beyond that. We've got to get the gay, lesbian, transgender. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Just live your life, love one another, and let's move on with it. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I think one of the other big stereotypes about something like bipolar disorder is the fact that if people um, are diagnosed with it, that they're they're just not able to function. And you know, I think you definitely break the stereotype with that. You know, again, as far as you know, you've had a very full work life and mm-hmm. always, um, you know, since you were a young adult, uh, seems lived on your own, and you know, if we're f- financially. Um, successful and so on and so forth so it's one of those things where uh again i think people who just you know they hear that you know kind of the severe mental illness mm-hmm. and it's like okay they need to be in a group home somewhere or they had living with their parents or whatever but right. you know that wasn't you and again you were very um it, not to overly dwell on the sex component but um you were very resourceful in, in getting your needs met, even mm-hmm. though it was on a healthy way. So you had this, um, you were very high functioning. Mm-hmm. And it's something that, yeah. you know, again, I think that that's something where a lot of people may not understand that it's just, it's how, it's how your mood is. And I had periods where I was not functioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talk about it in one of the chapters in the book where I had to go on FMLA intermittent. But I refused. I was doing a project at work because I'm a project manager and I was doing a very big project at work and I refused to let the project fail. So I was taking a day off like every week. I would take, I would work Monday, Tuesday, take off Wednesday on FML, intermittent FMLA because I could, I just couldn't function because my medication stopped working. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing people don't realize. You've got to get on the right medication. Not every pill is right for every person. Sure. You, it's going to take some time um, to it's get a on. trial and error process. It, there worse. is a huge mm-hmm. trial and error process, and you've just got to stick with it. Because once you're on that right med, you know, or meds, it could be a couple of meds, mm-hmm. um, it changed my life, you know. Sure. It, it, it can change the life for anybody. Mm-hmm. Just got to let it. One of the things of, 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 of working with people with bipolar disorder, it's a common theme, and you expressed that earlier in our interview, is that um, one of the reasons that you didn't talk about the mania is because you liked it, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, I've heard that yeah. story time and time again of people saying, I just, I love that feeling. It was like being high. It was, yeah. uh, you know, I had energy and I had... Um, I just, you know, I, I didn't want, I wanted to get rid of the depression, but as far right. as the highs, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to keep those, but those were something that was, you know, very self-destructive. Right. And so it's, it, was there a grieving process almost when you took the meds and you knew that they were going to be gone? Um, yeah, there was behavior modification that I put myself through, not through any kind of program. But to stop going to the bookstores, to stop going to the adult theaters, Mm -hmm. I had to modify my behavior and find something to replace it with. Mm -hmm. I chose gardening. I had a house Mm -hmm. um, that I was luckily able to buy. Um, And so I tore out the yard and put in all these great gardens. And I was lucky to, to, to do that. I was able to modify my behavior mm-hmm. did you, on did my you, did own. Did you just need to stay away from those areas at first? Like because yeah, it was I had to drive triggering? through Highland Park today, and it totally triggered me okay. coming wow. here. First time I've been to Highland Park in 25 years. Oh, wow. Really? And I literally almost had a panic attack. But wow. I'm like, okay, I got to get there. I got I, I can't let Tootsie down. It's a no-fly zone for you. It is a no-fly zone. And having to drive through there today wow. mm-hmm. was was very difficult. Well, but that's kind of cool that you uh, that you did it. Yeah. You know? And I'm, I'm sure the first time is the hardest. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. You know? It's all part of the healing process. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So have you talked with many people um, who are bipolar? 
Since your diagnosis? I am on a bunch of Facebook groups. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of hurt people. There's a lot of people who just can't function Mm -hmm. because they're not, they've given up on medication. They don't want medication. They don't want the side effects. Yeah. I'm 215 pounds and I'm 50 pounds overweight and I put on 40 pounds when I went on the Rylar. Mm-hmm. And you know what? If you don't love me at this size, fuck you. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, love me for who I am. Sure. Love me, all 215 pounds of me. And if you can't, then I don't want to deal with you. I don't have time for you. Mm-hmm. Because you feel so much better. You feel I like feel, yourself. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like I'm human. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, I do have moods. You know, I have good days and bad days. You know, I am able to cry. I can't believe I cried when I, I can't believe I didn't cry when I talked about George. My, my PR people are going to be so happy (laughs) Uh, because we worked on that yesterday. You've been crying every time. I've been bawling Mm -hmm. like the Oprah ugly cry. (laughs) Um, But I did good. I did good today. Um, We, we have to find new questions then. Yeah. Cry. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, no, usually when I talk about George, I mm-hmm. I cry. That had to be, I can't imagine having a therapist one day and then the next day they're gone. You're in the middle of treatment. He literally had a heart attack and he, died. He did. He had yeah. a heart attack and died. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, what did that do to you? Oh, uh, that- I, well, I sobbed for, I, I found out at work. And I tell the story in the book. You can buy it. It's on Amazon. <laughs> uh, and uh, I tell the story. I was at work, and I just went into a conference room and sobbed for an hour. Mm-hmm. Just sobbed. He was your only confidant? He, he was, the person he was it. Knew, yeah. He was the only one who knew. He was the only one I trusted. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was tough. Yeah. It was real tough. But uh, well, I think he'd be proud of you now. You know. Well, I'm know. trying to find his family mm. so I can give them a copy of the book. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, what do you what do you hope to gain by by sharing your story of, you know, by actually publishing a book and putting it out there? What was your goal? My goal was to end the stigma, mm-hmm. end the stereotypes, and the hatred. Because there's a lot of people that don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Just like they don't understand different cultures. And so they hate the different culture. Uh, They don't understand what it is to be gay. So they hate us. They don't understand what it is to be bipolar. So they hate us. Or, so I I just want to end end the stigma. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That that's really my ultimate goal, and help help some people realize that there is hope. Yeah, that there is there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Sure. Well, I I I'm, I know for a fact that there's people out there they're struggling right now with the exact same thing that yeah. you did for years, and it's one of those things where if someone can read your book and get to the point where they say, "This guy turned a corner." He was able to open up. He was able to get on the right meds, and he was able to better his life. And that's that's a strong message. Yeah, especially you know to a lot of the maybe young guys that are out there mm-hmm. that right. might be you know because f- in today's world, hookup culture, with all the online opportunities. Oh, you know what I mean? It's you don't have to go to CD bookstores anymore. No, or the no, park. you just go to Tinder and mm-hmm. Grinder and yeah. Scruff mm-hmm. and. Bear four one one, and I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a that was kind of an interesting part of your book to me is that you you crossed many time periods where you started with personal ads in newspapers and you end with scruff. Yes, you know, your, your true Gen X sex addict. Where yes, you went through all the different yes. phases, but it probably would have been helpful to you to have 
heard a story like this or to just know what by we had no was, role models you, you didn't know and so like you said you just thought you were being gay you didn't even know right right we had no role models mm-hmm. we didn't have alan mm-hmm. in in 1991 when i graduated from high school uh we harvey um harvey by the way uh, fire firestone firestein mm-hmm Harvey Firestein. Firestein. His memoir is kicking my ass <laughs> uh, in the ratings, uh, and he's killing it for everyone else. So uh, don't buy his memoir. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, so no, catty. no, kidding. <laughs> um, but you know, give a guy a break. You know, he yeah. came out. He came out the same day I came out. Harvey uh, Firestein. Yeah, his wow. his memoir came out. Oh, oh his okay. memoir came like, out he the came same. Out long before you. Did no, no, out. his memoir came out the same day and okay. has been. Kicking my ass yeah. ever, you know, down the the Amazon court, um, but no, we didn't have we didn't have role models like like Harvey, mm-hmm. and you know, we needed them. We needed champions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I grew up with examples of hate and intolerance, and that's what I hope my book will end. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no need for it in this generation. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story, Rob. Um, For anyone interested, the book is on Amazon. It is currently number one in the bipolar... Bipolar new release category. That's great. It's Mm -hmm. called I, Rob Graves, My Struggle with Childhood Trauma, Homosexuality, and Bipolar Disorder. Um, Anyone watching, we'd love to hear your comments on if you think Rob broke any stereotypes, drop a comment below. Also remind you to like uh, this video and subscribe to our channel as it'll help our channel grow and um, stay tuned for more in-depth interviews that break stereotypes. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Thanks, Thank Rob. Thanks, Rob.